I want to talk about confusion. When I was a worldly young man, I was confused about God. Uh, today, I stand before you equally confused, but not confused about God, but confused about man. You know, we celebrate Jesus redeeming us from eternal death with his substitutionary sacrifice. He died on the cross for us. He conquered death. He, and, he, and he really ratified that. It was evidenced by the resurrection and for any human being who will make him Savior uh, and Lord. I played that video because of something that happened to me this Wednesday at 5 o'clock in the morning. I woke up with this in my mind. I began thinking about, you know, we celebrate two indispensable miracles, the incarnation of Christ, God coming into the flesh, and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I began thinking about, you know, there are other miracles too that we probably should not forget and probably should be celebrating. And I was thinking about in all the gospels, there is one amazing miracle that's recorded in, in all four Gospels, and that is the feeding of the 5,000. And I, I began thinking that, you know, really what an amazing feat that was, that Jesus took the lunch of a little boy, a couple loaves of bread and some fish, and he fed 5,000 men, which means there's probably a lot more than 5,000, but it's certainly at least 5,000. Can you imagine um, what that would have taken if we had a, a fellowship meal after the service today and we were going to feed 5,000 people, what size tractor trailer load of food do you think we would have to have to feed 5,000? And, and when, it, when it was done, I mean, they had more left over than they started. I mean, what an amazing miracle that Jesus did that, that proved his divinity, that he had authority over the very elements of, of this world. And I thought, this is such an amazing miracle that we shouldn't just... Uh, dispense with that and overlook it. So I thought, here's what we should do to celebrate Jesus feeding 5, 10, 15,000 people and that great miracle he did. So here's what I decided. Well, as we're going to uh, get the world to recognize Jesus and who he is in this miracle, I thought they probably really won't get that excited about the miracle itself. So we probably should do something to kind of gin it up a little bit. So here's what I thought. 100% true, not lying to you. Five o'clock in the morning, woke up with this thought. So here's a slide that reflects my thought. We're going to call it Zeus. Now Zeus, as you know, was this great mythological warrior god. And the mythological warrior god was known for his lightning power. And so you see the lightning bolts there. I thought, well, if we just call this holiday Zeus... That may not be descriptive enough. And so I thought, well, we want to get the, the kids involved. And so I, I, you know, I'm thinking, right? It's early in the morning, but I'm still thinking. You remember that amazing experiment that Ben Franklin did with electricity when he flew the kite, you know, and he had the key. Remember that whole thing? And I thought this would be great for to get the kids involved with the lightning. Do you remember Zeus? And then and we had the kids involved. And of course, we could have uh, cupcakes with lightning bolts on it. And uh, maybe even got Pegasus involved there with a little treat there. And I thought this would be a great way for us to communicate to the world about this amazing miracle called Jesus Feeds the 5,000. Now, how many of you think this is a great idea? Who's going to join me in this, in this celebration? Anybody? Nobody? No one is going to join me in my celebration of Jesus' miracle with Zeus. Now, as I mentioned, I was a young worldly man confused by God. Now I'm a Christian adult confused by man. We think about Jesus and the things that he's done. We remember the sacrifice of Christ dying on the cross and, and him trying um, uh, umphing, triumph, wow, triumphing, that's not a word, is it? Doesn't sound right in my head. He overcame death, okay? We celebrate that by a holiday called Easter. Now, Easter is the name of a pagan goddess. Do you know that? Easter, Esther, Astra, Ishtar, 
Astaroth in the Bible. Those are all different languages for the same goddess, fertility goddess. And this is evidenced because we celebrate in the spring, the season of rebirth, because she's the fertility goddess. And that's why you have bunnies, because bunnies are prolific in, in uh, fertility. That's why you have eggs, because that's a symbol of fertility. Now, this is why you see me as a confused young man, confused about God, who had to wade through the sewer of confusion of the world to find Jesus. And when you wonder why I don't like Easter and eggs and jelly beans, I like, I like peanut butter and jelly beans. You probably could never figure that out, but I do. But why do we do the things that we do? And I know you think I'm weird, and you think I'm, well, I, I, I'm just a fun stealer. I don't have any fun. Yeah, I, you guys have met my children, right? Do they look deprived of fun to you? Do, do they seriously? <laughs> I'm not trying to rock the boat, I'm, I'm trying to sink the ship, okay? I'm trying to challenge your thinking because confusion, Babylon the Bible calls it, is what keeps people from heaven and uh, continues their path to hell. And I don't want to participate in that. I, I'm all about the resurrection of Jesus, okay? I'm all about the incarnation of Christ. I'm all about feeding the 5,000, but you see how strange it is when I gave you the exact scenario with different details of what we do. And I remember being a child and, and knowing, knowing something that Easter was supposed to be about Jesus, but I never could figure out what it had to do with bunnies and eggs. Confusion. Now, now what you do in your own home is between you and God, and you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but I hope I've given you something to think about today. That was my goal. I know I started off very heavy this morning, but I want to challenge your thinking. If you will have an open, active, and noble mind this morning, then I think you'll get the very thing you need to get. Don't tell me I'm a mean old curmudgeon who doesn't like to have fun. Not true. To see me at the concert yesterday. I had fun. <clears throat> I grew up confused about God and the fact that I had to go through all of that confusion to find the truth of God makes it a very personal subject to me because I came this close from missing the kingdom of God in a world of confusion. And this is why I ask that we as a church, as we assemble, we only focus on God. We focus on Jesus Christ. We focus on his kingdom and nothing else. And because I want to be, uh, I want to be in the light and I want to walk in the light and I want to avoid the darkness and the grayness of confusion. And so today I'd like to talk about confusion from God's word. And so as, I'm going to be asking you to make a, a decision this morning. Every single one of you, I'm going to be asking you to make a decision. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit. Um, now, imagine... This is the very last hours of your life. The very last hours of your life, how would you spend that time? Well, in John chapter 13, if you have your Bible, I'd like to encourage you to pull out your Bible today. I'm going to be staying almost entirely in John chapter 13 and 14. It'll be easy to follow along. In John chapter 13, it starts off with this, and it says, uh, as we begin to look at the, the last hours of Jesus' life, it says, it was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. I may not have this one on the screen. I may not have made a slide for this one. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. So it's the final hours of Jesus' life. He's getting ready to leave this world. And uh, what would you do if this were the final hours of your life? If, if this day was the last day you would be on this planet, what would you eat today? What would your last meal be? What would your last words that you would say to your loved ones, maybe even your father? Well, what would you fight for in the last few moments of your life? And that's what we're going to be looking at very deeply today. The most powerful moments, I think, uh, some of the most powerful moments anyway of Jesus' last hours. His last meal, his last prayers, and the final battle of his life. 
Jesus' last hours are some of the most important moments in all of history. There really is no greater subject we could talk today uh, when we're talking about the gospel than, than the things leading up to the cross, which is the fulfillment of Jesus' life, and then the resurrection. So we begin with the Last Supper, his final meal. The location, the setting of this chapter 13 and 14 of John is a miracle in itself. If you read about it, it says that when they go to celebrate the Passover, and we're going to talk about the occasion in a minute, they need to, to go to an upper room, a place to celebrate this Jewish memorial feast. And Jesus says to uh, Peter and John, he tasks them with a job of going into the city, find a man carrying a water jar, uh, follow him and say, hey, my master needs a place to meet to celebrate the Passover and get him a place to meet. And that's exactly what happens. In fact, the word behold there is in some translations. I love that idea of behold. It means something shocking and amazing is about to happen, to behold. The occasion for this miraculous location is the Passover feast. The Passover was also an amazing miracle. The Jews had been in captivity for hundreds of years, praying day and night for God to deliver them. And in one final blow, as in their, their, in, in their Egyptian slavery, God takes all the firstborn of Egypt, but he tells his people that if you will make a sacrifice and take the blood of that sacrifice and put it over the doorposts and the lentil, then when I come over the land to take the firstborn, I will not take anybody in your household. And if, and if I see that blood, that covering, I will pass over. And so they were told to remember that amazing thing, that the blood of the lamb gave them a covering so God would pass over them and not take their firstborn. So the apostles that had an agenda in this meal, they wanted to, as faithful Jews, wanted to celebrate the Passover. So here they are in the upper room. That's what everyone else in the entire city was doing, was celebrating the Passover, and that's why they're there. But I want you to know that Jesus' agenda was different than the apostles' agenda. In fact, Jesus said, I have waited eagerly to celebrate this Passover with you. And so he begins to stress the very important truths to the apostles before Jesus returns back to heaven. In verse 2 of our text, it says this. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. That's what happens next. Now, next Sunday, next Lord's Day, we are going to assemble for a breakfast, aren't we? As we remember once again the resurrection of Christ, which we do, by the way, every week. Remember the resurrection of Christ. We're going to do so in our special emphasis with a meal together. Not completely unlike the meal that they were taking, even though their meal was highly centered around remembering the Passover. There's a reason why they assembled. There's a reason why they came together. And so they were all in one place. They were alone. Now, a lot of times we don't want to be alone, but I think the apostles were ready to be alone. They had been with crowds, throngs of people, and the truth is they're exhausted. They're exhausted, no doubt physically, it's been a very busy time. No doubt they're exhausted uh, emotionally. And we're going to find out in a little bit they're actually exhausted spiritually too. And we'll talk about the garden in a little bit because that's what happens after this. Jesus' agenda, which I said was different than just to have them celebrate any old Passover meal, he begins to teach them some things. One of the most important things is that he washed their feet. Now, the title of this message, as you have seen, is in your bulletin, and you saw that slide, Do You Get It? I ask you that question because the apostles really did not get it. They'd been with Jesus for 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, that long, and they still don't get it. And there's a reason why they don't get it. And there may be a reason why you don't get it, or why maybe uh, I don't get it sometimes, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. So here they are, Jesus is washing their feet. As Jesus mentions, he's dining with a person who's going to betray him, someone close to him who's going to lay a betrayer's kiss upon his cheek just shortly after this. He's dining this very special meal with him. Jesus knows this. Then Jesus takes the cup. He takes the cup. This was a Passover cup. It reminded them of the lamb of the blood that was over the doorpost and lentil. Jesus took that cup and said, this, cu this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And thereby Jesus beginning to, to reassign the Passover meal to the Lord's Supper. Remember that Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the one in which God passes over our sins and overlooks our sin. Then he took the bread. He broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this bread was the Jews did the Passover meal to remember that they had to leave Egypt swiftly. It was unleavened bread. It didn't have time to rise because God said, when I tell you to go, you go. You don't pass go. You don't collect $200. You don't make bread to let it rise. You make it and you go. And the memorial feast remembered the unleavened bread. Jesus took that bread and said, this bread is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it. Do it in remembrance of me. Because he is a body and it was broken. But in the resurrection, we are his body that he's left for us. So he took that. And so Jesus is, is taking this ordinary, something that the apostles had been doing every year, probably since they were born, as faithful Jews celebrating the Passover meal, Jesus took this meal and had a different agenda. Right after that, Judas storms out. And then Jesus begins talking about the eminent kingdom and even heaven itself. And the disciples who are there are listening intently. Then they sing songs and Jesus prays. And they get up and they cross over the, Kid the Kidron Valley and they go into the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed in the garden while the disciples slept. We'll get back to that a little bit. And all of this time, in spite of all the emotion in Jesus' voice and all the electri electrifying power of Jesus' words, there is an over overwhelming truth. Do not miss this truth. What is the truth? Well, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Look at verse 6 now of chapter 13. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, we're backing up now into this meal. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. In other words, you don't get it, Peter, but later you will get it. You don't get it, but you will get it. And I want to know here in the 21st century in 2017, do you get it? That's the punchline of today's message. So I want you to be thinking about that. The disciples of Jesus, uh, you know, everything that they had done in the last three and a half years, who they were in their relationship to Jesus, where they went and what they'd seen, all those things they still, at the end of this time, they don't understand, they don't get it. Jesus washes their feet, their dirty old feet. Peter wanted to prove how humble he was and how holy he was. And so he said, first of all, he says, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. And he said, well, if I can't wash you, you no problem in me. And then Jesus says, well, give me a complete bath head to toe. He says, you don't need that, Peter. You don't need that. Get the message. He didn't get it, you see. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Verse 12. When he had wa finished washing their feet, he put on clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? <laughs> he asked them. No, they didn't understand. At the time in which Jesus was giving some of the most important teachings, you know what they were doing? Arguing about who was the greatest among them. Sounds like a church, huh? When Jesus is giving some of the most important things, they're arguing about who is the greatest of them. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Isn't it interesting how Satan does his best distracting when Jesus is trying to do, when God is trying to do his most important teaching to us? Gee, you, you would think there was a conspiracy. Verse 21 and 22 now. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. They're still clueless. They still don't know what's going on. He even identifies it by the guy who's dipping his bread in. At the same time, I it's that guy. When Jesus runs, I mean, when Judas runs out after Jesus says to him, Judas, what you're going to do, do it quickly. They still don't know what's going on. They didn't get it. 
They didn't get it. They didn't think, well, G uh, Judas must be on some kind of an errand or something. Now look at verse 36 of our text. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, when Jesus was speaking about who he was, what he was getting ready to do, this teaching is still lost on them. They don't get it. And Jesus took that cup and the bread, like I mentioned a little while ago, and he ate and they drank, and they didn't understand. They didn't get it. In fact, Jesus actually prophesied about this. He alluded to this back in chapter 6 of John. He said, unless you eat the, 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 the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And they were so troubled, the disciples were, by this teaching. If you read there in John 6, near the end, it says, this is a hard teaching. Who can even accept it? Because they were asking, how can this man give his body and his blood for us to eat and drink? This is the truth that forced them all to face some things. Judas faced this truth that he didn't get it when he ran out of that room, that Passover meal that night. Peter had to face that he didn't get it when he fled into the dark and, as, and denied Jesus three times. Uh, most of the others did not get it because when it came to uh, a difficult trial, when they arrested Jesus, all of them scattered into the darkness. They didn't get it. They didn't get it, even though the real truth was staring them right in the face. And I have to face that truth, and you have to face that truth. And so now I want you to think about, do you get it? Let's look oh so briefly at the words that Jesus said to his disciples. Now in chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I am going to prepare a place for you. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? They didn't get it. Do you get it? Now here's how you're gonna know whether you get it or not. Do you worry about your life, your retirement, your job, your family, your bills, your education, your future? If you're always troubled about those things, let's be honest here, can you really handle the truth? Do you get it? Truth is most of us don't get it. You worry, like Jesus said, he said, who can by worrying at a single hour a single cubit, a single second to their life by worrying. He says, why do you worry about worldly things? Look at the birds. The birds don't plant seeds, they don't harvest crops, but look how I take care of them. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't plant or, 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 or reap either, yet look how I take care and how I adorn them with such beauty. Even Solomon himself was not so uh, covered with beauty. Some of you grew up in a Christian home some of you, like me, did not. So what? So what? The truth is that you and I have a family. It's called the church. And you are surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses who have gone on before you, men and women of faith, who got it and want you to get it too. Listen, here's what I want you to say. This is, this is, this is going to challenge you whether you get it or not today because this is ultimately about you and not about God. It's about you and not about God. It's about learning to trust him, not the stuff in your life. It's about trusting God, not the stuff in your life. Down in verse six of our text, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. They didn't get it. Do you get it? Are you searching for God? Do you know where to go? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing with your life? Are you constantly seeking and searching after something to satisfy your soul? Are you looking for something that gives you some kind of emotional thrill that resonates through your very deepest core or some kind of emotion that fades? 
Are you looking for something that's new and different? Are you hooked? Are you addicted? Are you dependent? Are you lost? However you want to say it, you are never going to find it that way. Some of you I know here, I've heard of that song by Peggy Lee. Is that all there is? It's one of the, it, it came out the first year I was born. I don't remember it from then, but uh, is that all there is? If you want to read some depressing lyrics, read Peggy Lee's, is that all there is? She talks about how she searches everything, and is that all there is? So let's go basically get drunk, she says, you know, because every time I try to go do something, and I say to myself, is that all there is? I, I fall in love with somebody, and I get disappointed. Is that all there is? And she can't find anything in this world to satisfy her. But I want you to know that that's not just in the secular world, the worldly world. It's also in the spiritual world that people have this thing where they say, is that all there is? Well, I showed up to church on, on Sunday morning. I don't know what the difference is. Is that all there is? Or I, I prayed prayers to God. Is that all there is? I assemble with the saints, or I, uh, I fellowship, and, and I, I read my Bible, and, I, and I, I'm looking for the change, and I want to know, is that all there is? And here's the truth of the reason why you and I don't get it sometimes, because they think, you know, maybe I just need to really do something great for God. If I just pray harder, I work harder, I study harder, I seek the Spirit of God more earnestly and strongly, then I will find peace and fulfillment in life that I am so desperately looking for. If that is you this morning, I'm here to tell you, you don't get it. Because listen, it's not about you doing something great for God. It's about God doing something great for you. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, that's not what I usually think about, or that's not what I usually hear preached, but this is what I want. Just stay with me. Hang on a little bit, because I think this will be abundantly clear, and I hope that you leave here today getting it. If you think that your religion is about appeasing an angry God, no, you see, here's the deal. When you live a life that you were designed and purposed to live, then you benefit. When you're in harmony with the Creator and your Heavenly Father, it's you that benefits, not God. God is not getting something from you. You are getting something from God. That's what I mean why you don't get it. And you think that if you showed up today because God's getting something out of you being here today. That's why you showed up. The truth is, God wants you here because you're supposed to be getting something. Yes, giving something, but also getting something when you're here. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, I thought I was doing them a favor when I looked both ways across the street. Well, wouldn't they be proud of me, you know? <laughs> when I brushed my teeth, I thought I was making them happy. When I, when I cleaned my room, you see, I thought, boy, aren't they going to be so happy my room is clean? I did those things. I look back as an adult, I realized those things benefited me, not my parents. I didn't get squashed when I crossed the road. That's good for me, okay? In fact, I still have some teeth in my head. That's good for me. My parents are not at home smiling because I got teeth in my mouth, right? The very fact that I learned how to clean, my parents are not benefiting from. I don't go drive a, a, a 11 hours to go clean their house, right? So I learned how to take care of myself. You, are you beginning to see a little bit what I'm talking about here? When we think, if it's not for God, then the other wrong thinking is, well, it must be for somebody else. Look, when you learn to take out the trash, that was so your brother didn't have to do it. When you wash the dishes, it's so your sister didn't have to do it, right? But listen to Jesus' words here in chapter 14, verse 21 now. He says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. And then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? 
You see, they still didn't get it. And I want to ask you, do you get it? Love is an action, not an emotion. Here's the thing. You want Jesus to be your Savior, but do you love him as your Lord? And if you love him as your Lord, do you love him as your loved one, your heavenly father, your brother? We love the idea of heaven, but we don't like the idea of carrying the burden of a lost world so they don't go to hell. Okay, this is the part where you, you start to get it. Why do you share your faith? To obey God? Sure you do. To say the lost? Well, absolutely. But here's what I'm here to tell you today. The reason why you share your faith is because if you don't learn what it means to fulfill your purpose in life, then you will never get it. It's not just to obey God. It's not just to snatch souls from the fire. It is about fulfilling your purpose. The, the very reason that you and I are still drawing a breath today, if you are in Christ, is for really one reason. To glorify God by going to share our faith. And so, yes, God is obeyed. And uh, people are saved. But ultimately, who is benefiting is you and me. You know who, who benefits the most? For me preaching a sermon, I do. You know who benefits the most when I go help someone who's in need? I do. See, here's the rub. The reason why you don't get it and why I don't get it sometimes is because we don't realize that obeying God is obeying a God who has got my best interest in mind. And when you obey God, you're benefiting yourself. It's not just to appease God that came up with a bunch of random ideas and just do these things. But we treat it that way, don't we? Well, I better read my Bible today because God will be mad at me. Or I better pray to God because he'll get mad he didn't hear from me. I better go to the church on Sunday or I, I will be guilty. I'll feel guilty all week long ago. And the reason why you struggle to do those things is because you don't get it. God has you do those things for your benefit, not his benefit. And others benefit too, but ultimately, it benefits us. Heaven is not your purpose. Heaven is not your purpose. It's your destination. Our purpose is about snatching souls out of the fire. And yes, the souls benefit, and God is obeyed, but you are benefiting because you are fulfilling the very promise that God breathed life into you. That's why you're here. That's why you're still here. If you are wondering and wandering around this life being miserable and distracted by your physical life and your job and your bills, and you're wondering, why am I here? The answer is staring you right in the face. Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross. Here's where you're going to start to really get it. Who benefited when Jesus died on the cross? You say, well... We all did. That's true. Or maybe the Father did, because he obeyed the Father. No. Jesus came into this world to be sacrificed on a cross for you and for me. That's why when he got in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he got down on his knees, and he was praying so fervently that, 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 that the sweat was dropping like blood to the ground, he said, if it's possible, Father, for this cup to be removed from me, so be it. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Because Jesus came to accomplish his purpose. Do you get it? That's what made it fulfilling. That's what made him the Messiah, to fulfill his purpose. And when you and I begin to fulfill our purpose and we get it, that's when we begin to have the kind of life that Jesus died for us to have. In John 17, 24, it says, Father, I want those you have given me 
to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory of the one you've given me because you love me before the creation of the world. You have given these to me. This is my stewardship. This is my purpose. And this is what I came to fulfill. And this is what I am going to do. He loved them. He loves us. But that is not why he went to the cross. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill his purpose. Not my will, but thine be done. That is why he died. This is, when you look at the, when you look at Jesus, you only begin to understand him in the context of the cross. That's when you begin to get it. You say, why would he come here? Why would he sacrifice himself? For me, while we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. People who spat upon him and ripped out his beard and beat him to being unrecognizable, Jesus died for them because that was his purpose. This is the power of the cross. This is why we have a, a time when we, we remember the cross and the resurrection. That's the power of it. It's the purpose. This is uh, when we unconditionally, undeservedly, and desperately need the kind of love that God gives, we get it. We look at the cross. This is why when the disciples, that's when they begin to get it. When they saw the cross, Peter got it in the courtyard after the cross when the rooster crowed three times. Judas, he failed to repent, but he got it when he hanged himself on a tree. John got it when he stood at the foot of the cross and he watched his Savior die. Thomas got it when he was able to put his fingers into the, the, the nail scars and put his hand into Jesus' side. He got it because he saw Jesus in the context of the cross. And so I ask you, do you get it? Now I want you to look at this video. <clears throat> this video is a time of someone putting a puzzle together. And you look at it and you say, well, I ask you, do you get it? What is it? I have no idea, right? You don't get it. What is it that we use? We do a, a puzzle. What do we use to contextualize the puzzle? The picture. It's on the front of the box, right? The reason why you don't know what that is, you, you, you see it now probably. You see a piece of it. You can start to get it, don't you? You're starting to get what that is. Because now you see the pieces come together. You see the Eiffel Tower in the middle there. But when you have the picture, you get it. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of scattered pieces on the ground. That's why the cross, you know, Peter, James, and John in the upper room with Jesus didn't get it. But they had a, a reason, I guess. <laughs> because they didn't have the context yet. They could not see it because they didn't have the picture yet. But we, when we have the picture, the puzzle makes sense. I'm trying to tell you here today, there's no excuse. You can take no comfort this morning in the fact that the disciples didn't get it on the other side of the cross because you're not on that side of the cross. You're on this side of the cross. And when you see Jesus fulfilled his purpose and that your job to be fulfilled is to fulfill your purpose, not doing God a favor, not just doing everybody else a favor, you're doing yourself a favor if you would just please do what God's telling you to do. Because when you obey God, he has your best interest in mind. If you would just get it, it would transform your life today in Christ. If you would just get it, that you're not just here to appease an angry God. You're not just sacrificing and stepping out of your comfort zone to tell other people about Jesus because God will be mad if you don't. That person might go to hell if I don't. Those are reasons, but ultimately you will get it when you realize you're doing your purpose that God gave you and why he created you. That's why all of us are here to celebrate the cross. It's time to wake up. Open your eyes and get it. Now, I told you today I was going to give every single person here a reason to make a decision. The decision that each of us has today is are you going to get it or not? And if you're really, if you're not going to get it, don't waste your time. I mean, seriously. Why waste your Saturday? The Bible says, 
If we are wrong about our purpose, we are men to be most pitied. Because we're living our whole, our whole life according to the purpose we understand God gave us. And if we, are, if we don't get it, then we should be pitied and mocked. But if we are right, and Jesus was raised from the dead, and death has been conquered, and we have been given a new purpose in our life. The reason why gave, God gave us physical birth and spiritual birth was to go about and share Christ and the light of Christ into a dark and dying world. If you don't want to get that today, I don't know what else I can do for you. You can't hide in the shadows of the apostles because you've got the cross to look at. But if you're not in Christ today, if you've not made him your Lord, you say, well, I, I, I'm a fan, Jesus. I like you a lot. I believe in you. I believe in your son. But if you've never fulfilled your purpose before God spoke the first atom or photon into existence in this universe, God had a purpose for you and for me. Already planned out. He knew exactly what we're going to be doing on the 9th of April, 2017, and what that purpose would be. And it goes into the overall context of why we're here today. And if you're not yet in Christ, if you haven't fulfilled that part of the plan yet, I, I beg you to do it today. Please don't wait anymore. It's time that you get it and you do it. Because the truth is, we don't know when the master, the king's coming home to collect to see who is of the faith. That's awesome.